All right, so we're going to do an optimization problem that is going to require us to minimize time here. And so here's the setup. We have a person, and they are out to sea right now. So they're floating around in a rowboat. And we know that this person is exactly, we'll say, two miles to the nearest shore point. We'll call that A. So they're out there. And what they need to do is they need to get to say the village. Maybe the village is over here. So this person now has some options. They can row straight across, walk the rest of the way. They can row straight to the village, or maybe they can row to some point between A and V. We'll call that P, and then walk the rest of the way. We want to figure out the path that is going to minimize the time it takes the person to get from here, from this point where they're at right now, to the village. Now, a couple things to consider. We know, I'm going to give you actually, that this person can row at a rate of two miles per hour. I'm also going to tell you that they can walk at the rate of three miles per hour. So they're not a very good rower. So how am I going to do this? What do I need to do? Well, let's again just kind of look at the path. The path that we're considering here is they're going to row to some point, potentially, and then walk the rest of the way. So you notice this picture doesn't have any variables, and sometimes that confuses people. You know, where's the variable? Where do you put the variable? I'm going to put the variable right here. All right, so x. So what does x need to be? How far away does p need to be, you know, from a? Maybe it is a. Maybe x is 0 which means that I'm going to row straight across. Or maybe x is the whole length of this distance, which is something else I'm going to give you. I'm going to tell you that the distance between a and v is 6. So if I label this x, everything else kind of gets labeled for me. So in other words, if this is x and the whole thing is 6, well, then this is 6 minus x. And if this is x and this is 2, and this is basically a right triangle, then this would be radical x squared plus 4. Right, and you can just get that from the Pythagorean theorem. So now understand that these things represent distances. This is 2 miles. This is x miles. I don't know what it is. This is 6 miles. This is 6 minus x miles. And this is radical x squared plus 4 miles. Now I said before that I want to minimize the time. So I'm going to write that down. Minimize the time. Well, if I'm going to minimize time, it would make sense that I would need a time function. So I'm going to call that t. Now what would it be? Well, in order to figure this out, I gotta use a little knowledge here. I gotta, you know, recall that distance equals rate times time. And if I was solving for time, it turns out if I divide both sides by r, that if I take a distance and I divide it by a rate, I'm going to get a time. And that's gonna be important here. So for example, say this length here, this length of this segment, this blue segment, the part where we're in the water, say that length is I'm going, to lay, I'm going to make up a value here. Obviously, it wouldn't be this, but say it was 4 miles. So if it's 4 miles and I can row at the rate of 2 miles per hour, that would mean 4 divided by 2, that it would take me 2 hours to do that. And that, that makes sense. Uh, but it's not 4. It's actually radical x squared plus 4. So what I'm going to write is the distance in the, in the water, radical x squared plus 4, divided by the rate that it takes me to row, which is 2. And this right here is going to represent the time in, we'll say, water. So how long it's going to take you to row. Now, that's not the only part of the equation here, right? I have to add to that the time that it takes me to walk. Well, that distance is 6 minus x, and the rate that I walk at is 3. So this right here represents the time on land, the time needed to walk. I should probably say time needed to row, time needed to walk, but you get the idea. So that's basically my equation here. So I'm going to clean it up a little bit. So I can write t as t of x, since it's strictly in terms of x. Maybe I'll write this as a half radical x squared plus 4. And maybe I'm going to write this as a third 6 minus x. And that's just preference. Now, I like to get intervals when I do optimization problems. It's not 100% necessary. Uh, it's just a personal preference of mine. So what do you mean interval? Well, x. What can x be? Well, what does x represent? x represents this distance here. Well, it seems reasonable to me, reasonable to me that x could be 0. If x was 0, 
that would mean that the person is going to row straight across and then walk the rest of the way. So x could definitely be 0. Well, how big could it be? Well, the biggest x could be would be 6, right? And what would that mean? That would mean that the person is going to row straight to the village because the path, p, the line, would be from here to here. So 6 would be that. And so now the rest really should be a walk in a park. I have a continuous function. In other words, there's no values of x that are going to break this function, cause division by 0 or negatives under radicals, anything like that. So I have a continuous function on a closed interval. So that's good news for me. I'm basically going to use the extreme value theorem to decide where my maxes and my mins are. So again, what is the extreme value theorem? The extreme value theorem basically says if you have a continuous function on a closed interval, you're guaranteed to have a max and you're guaranteed to have a min. It's an existence theorem. So me, being a good calculus student, know that, well, where could they occur at? They're either going to occur at a critical point or an end point. So just to kind of take you away from this problem for a second, think about it. If I have a continuous function, so a function I can trace without lifting up my pen, such as that one, and I look at it on a closed interval. So maybe I look at this function on this closed interval. So uh, maybe from this point here to that point there. So I have a continuous function on this closed interval. Well, I'm guaranteed to have an absolute max and min. And you can see your absolute max would occur right here, and your absolute min would occur right here. Now think about these points that they're occurring at, right? You have an end point where your absolute max is occurring at, and you have a critical point, a point where the derivative would be 0, where your absolute min is occurring at. And these are the points you need to consider. So you'll notice I have other critical points here. There's a critical point here, and a critical point here, and I also have this other endpoint. Now, if I didn't have a nice graph like this in front of me to make the decision of which is the largest and which is the smallest, think about how you would do it. You would just get all of the y values for each point and then compare them. Biggest is your max, smallest is your min. That's basically what we're going to do. Now, this is not the graph for this particular function t, so I'm going to erase that. All right, so here we go then. So basically, I need to get a critical point. So I'm going to take the derivative. All right, so here we go. So t prime of x. All right, the derivative of a constant times a function is the constant times the derivative of the function. The derivative of this composition here, I would like to consider this radical stuff, where stuff is a function of x. The derivative of radical stuff is going to be 1 over 2 radical stuff times the derivative of stuff. And the derivative of that innermost function, x squared plus 4, is going to be 2x. Okay? Plus, right, because the derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives, plus the derivative of this part. Well, again, you have a constant times a function, so the derivative is the constant times the derivative of the function, so it would be 1 third times the derivative of 6 minus x, which is negative 1. So one thing I notice, this 2, this factor of 2, can cross out with that factor of 2. And if I clean this up just a little bit, I get x over 2 radical x squared plus 4 minus 1 third. And that would be t prime of x. What do I want to do with t prime of x? I want to set it equal to 0 to get my critical points. Where I go from here to solve it, this is kind of like a personal preference. I probably would go ahead and add the 1 third over. So that's what I'm going to do. So I add the 1 third over and then cross multiply or multiply both sides by, you know, 3 times 2 radical x squared plus 4, however you want to think about it. I'm going to think of it as cross multiplying. Product of extremes equals product of means. So I cross multiply 3x equals 2 radical x squared plus 4. So now I have a radical equation. How do I solve a radical equation? I'm going to want to isolate the radical. So I would go ahead and divide both sides by 2. So I'm going to get 3 over 2x equals radical x squared plus 4. What was the point of isolating the radical so that I can square it? But if I square the right side, I've got to square the left side. And so when I do that, I'm going to go ahead and get 9 over 4 x squared equals x squared plus 4. Right? Remember all us good math students, we should know that when you square both sides of an equation when solving, you introduce the possibility of getting solutions that don't work, extraneous solutions. Uh, the video is not about that. We're not going to talk about it, but just a little recall. So what do I want to do now? Well, if it was me, maybe I'm going to subtract x squared over. But when I do it, I think of this as really like 4 over 4x four squared, right? So it's easy in my head to go ahead and do what I have to do here. 
So if I subtract 4 over 4x squared from 9 over 4x squared, I get 5 over 4x squared. Okay? Equals 4. Go ahead and multiply both sides by the reciprocal. So 4 times 5 over 4. And it's working out quite nicely here. Actually, not 5 over 4. Not working out that nice. Right? The reciprocal of 5 over 4 would be 4 over 5. So multiply, right? And we'll just show the work here. This is, what, this is what you get for not showing work sometimes. You multiply this side by 4 over 5, multiply that side by 4 over 5, right? Here, gonzo, that's why we did it. And so now over here, you're going to get 16 over 5. Let's go ahead and clean that up. So you get x squared equals 16 over 5. And so now I want to square root both sides. So I want to plus or minus square root both sides. So I'm going to get the square root of 16, which is 4, and then the square root of 5, which is, I don't know, it's the square root of 5. So a couple things here. You'll notice I got two x values that made the derivative 0. But one of them I certainly don't care about. I don't care about the negative because it's not in my interval. So the only value that I care about is 4 over radical 5. Now I'm going to go ahead and just figure out what that is as a decimal value here. So 4 divided by radical 5, it turns out, is going to be 1.788 dot, dot, dot. All right, so that's what it's going to be. All right, so now, am I done? Is that it? And no, I'm not done because, all right, yeah, this made the derivative 0, but I don't know, it, it could have been a min. It could have been a max. And this goes back to that picture that I had up here before where we need to compare the y values at the critical point, because that's what this is here, and the two endpoints. So what I'm going to do now, I like to write by the extreme value theorem, which remember is just an existence theorem. It says that you're going to have a max and you're going to have a min. And then what I do is I say, all right, well, in order to figure that out, I need to test my endpoints. All right, so we'll do that under there. And then I need to test my critical point. Okay, so test it where? Test it in the original function. So I need to do t of 0, t of 6. And then over here, you know what? I'm going to let x or I'm going to let little b equal 1.788 dot, dot, dot. This way I don't have to write that all the time when I want to use it. So now when I go to test, I'm going to test t of b. Maybe I'll make that green so we don't think that's a 6. t of b. Okay? All right, so we could work some of these out in our head. I mean, this one might be annoying. Uh, these could probably be worked out. I mean, I guess we can do 0. If we chuck 0 in, 0 squared plus 4 is 4. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 times a half is 1, so this would be 1. 6 minus 0 over here would be 6. Divided by 3 is 2. 1 plus 2 is 3. So we get 3. Right? So if we worked that out, we'd get 3. Now, 3 what? 3 hours. Kind of makes sense because this person's far out the shore. Now, what path is three hours? Well, remember, this is the x value. So x equals zero means that this person in this particular instance here would be coming straight across, so rowing straight across and then walking the rest of the way. Well, it turns out that's going to take that person three hours. Now I want to do t of six. T of 6 uh, isn't too bad either. If I do T of 6, 6 minus 6 is 0 over here, so this wipes out. And I get 6 squared, which is 36 plus 4, so square root of 40 times a half. All right, so let's just figure that out real quick. So the square root of 40 and then times a half or divided by 2. And then it turns out that that's a little bit longer. That's 3.162 dot, dot, dot hours. So a little bit over three hours. Now, what path is that? What are we talking about for that a little over three hours? So this path would be described as the person going sh here, right, where they are, and rowing the entire way. Turns out that that's going to take a little over three hours. Well, now we want to look at our critical point. So how am I going to do that? Well, basically what I'm going to do and maybe I can talk about the calculator syntax, is I'm going to take this value that I had in my calculator before, and I'm going to store it in some variable. I'm going to use b since I called it b. So now I have that in my calculator as b. 
And then I'm just going to plug it into the function, but I'm going to plug it in as B and not as 1.788, say, so I'm not really dealing with round-off error. So I have 0.5 times radical. We're going to go B squared plus 4. And then I'm going to do plus 1 third times 6 minus B. And it'd be cool if I can show you this in my calc, but I'm not. So what do you get here? So here I get 2.745 dot, dot, dot. Okay, so now what does that mean? Well, let's think about this now. You tested two endpoints, got these times. You tested the one critical point, you got this time. Well, where do you have what? Well, it looks like we have a maximum time here. But we're not looking for the max, right? We're not looking for the absolute max. We're looking for the minimum time. Well, that's going to occur at this critical point. So we have an absolute minimum time of 2.745 hours. What is that path represented? Or how is that path represented? Basically, if you wanted to give this person directions on what to do to get to the village in the least amount of time, you'd say, listen, find that nearest shore point A. Spot it out. What you need to do is you need to row at a point that is 4 over radical 5 miles east of that. So this point right here would be 1.788 miles east of A. If you land there and then walk the rest of the way, you're going to get there in the least amount of time. And that would be represented by 2.745 hours. All right, so understand that the B value is this X value here, right? That's the the x value that we found, and that the actual t value, the t of b value, is representing the total time. And there you go. There we go. We minimized uh, time from rowing to the village.